It's a Tuesday. It's Bob McCowan and John Shannon with you. Um, the NBA final may come to a conclusion tonight, as long as there's no postponement of the game, which would be about the only thing that the NBA hasn't done to stretch this thing out. I want my summer to start. You know, it be interesting as if they did postpone this game and decided to play two on Thursday, like baseball. Uh, yeah, like but, two, so, but maybe two 40 minute games. I was going to say, redu- go cut it from 48. So this has been painfully long. I mean, I know they always do this in the NBA in the final. I don't know why. You know what it is probably, John? It's probably because we've gotten used to lots of games every night during the pandemic as they were mm-hmm. trying to cram seasons in mm-hmm. to a shorter period of time. And now this has just been a snore. Well, I mean, the games have been interesting. Yeah. It, but, it, just, it just, when you have two days between games in the same city, you know, you've got a problem. Well, yeah. I mean, and that, that, that's an issue that the extra day between travel days is, is one thing, but you know, this uh, la- last week was to me the best example as uh, you know, it was, you know, Sunday, there was a game and then Wednesday and then Saturday, I, one game through the weekdays. It makes no well, sense to me at all. And I mean, I don't see the ratings, the television ratings, but this can't be helpful, can it? Well, uh, th- th- I would tell you that because, quite frankly, it's you know, they're you know, Phoenix is I think number ten in the in 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 uh, the United States as a market. Milwaukee certainly is what f- number forty in 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 the United States. Uh, they're trying to let the networks position this uh, to get the uh, maximum ratings possible. I think that's the only reason. And the numbers appear to be okay. They're they're not spectacular, but they're, cer- they're certainly better than the bubble last year, Bob. That's for sure. Well, all right, but I don't know. Maybe our guests know more. Doug Smith of the Toronto Star, Bob Ryan of the Boston Globe will join us. We'll talk hoops after these messages. And we are back. It's Bob McCown. It's John Shannon. And we are joined by uh, two of our favorite basketball guys. Uh, although they know much more than just basketball. Uh, Doug Smith of the Toronto Star. Bob Ryan in Boston of the Boston Globe are uh, with us. I want to get, we were going to get to the NBA final uh, and uh, where we are and what we expect. In, and if it will ever end. Uh, and if it will ever end in uh, game six. Uh, I want to talk about free agency first. And we were chatting earlier, and it seems as though, with no disrespect intended, Kyle Lowry may be the most sought-after free agent in the market this year. Would you concur, Mr. Smith? Oh, I think he'd certainly be at the top of my list. He's a, you know, 35-year-old guy, champion, six-time All-Star. A lot of teams could use his leadership and his abilities. Um probably affordable maybe you know obviously down a maximum value player so yeah i think he's going to attract a lot of interest and i i again i don't i don't think this is a stellar cast of free agents out there but i think a lot of teams have bits they got to fill and i think lowry's going to be at the, on a lot of lists mr ryan why is this not such a stellar cast we are used to seeing at least a couple of really big guys out there but unless somebody um decides to undo their contract um that doesn't seem to be in play right now it's not just circumstantial it depends on on the how people have signed contracts and what length and you know it, it, it's there's no uh pattern uh, other than that i mean right it's rel- relatively random in terms of uh, it just so sometimes it just so happens that uh there are x number of of really big deal guys or have a contract up and in our in that category and other years or not that's all but i agree with doug about the viability of of kyle lowry i know one team that has to find a point guard before the season starts <laughs> and that I'm, that I'm sitting 15 miles from where they play and <laughs> and i know that so i don't know that they have any specific interest in in him but i do know that they need a point guard do you well, think the- Bob, do you think that the celtics will under new management change tack entirely is this going to be like a I don't know, cleaning house, probably not the right phrase, but with Brad moving up upstairs, does he change focus? Well, I, we don't know. This is what we're watching, Brad, to see how he operates. And the first thing he did was make a surprising trade to bring yeah. Al Horford. And 
um, you know, who was who, who had been benched, you know, but swears he's got something left in the tank in this circumstance, and he was happy here to start with. Blah blah blah. All right, fine. So we'll see how he's going to operate. Danny broke into his uh, started his administrative career by being very bold and fearless. I thought, and I thought that I used to say he was the most fearless general manager in the league. And, and of course, in, in 2007, he, he built a championship team in one draft, in one night, two, you know, with, why, uh, on draft night, 27th of June, 2007. He trades a fifth pick to Seattle. He gets Ray Allen. He persuades his friend uh, Danny Ainge to hand over Kevin Garnett. He, Garnett will come only because they've got, you know, he's going to go join up two all-stars. All right, long, long, long. And he's made a few other moves that are, that are you know, uh, interesting. We don't know how Brad's going to be. I don't know. Brad, by nature, you thought you'd think as a cautious person. But uh, maybe we're going to find out what he's like in, in this responsibility. He's never been in this kind of role before, naturally. Hey, Doug, in talking about Lowry, are you discounting the Raptors in all of this? No, not at all. I think I, I think it would be wise for them to bring him back on a two-year deal somewhere in the 45 to $50 million range as a transitional period because I think he's still got gas in the tank. And I think if they want to continue their uh, winning ways, I think they, they should, they should con- absolutely consider bringing him back. I think sign-in trades are virtu- are very difficult to pull off in the NBA under salary cap rules to get value and to get financial flexibility or whatever you want. And frankly, there's no better point guard out there than Kyle Lowry. So you got him, you can pay him without regard to the cap. You know that he works well with Fred Van Vliet. You know that he gets along well with Nick Nurse. You see the core of the team that he led to a championship two years ago. So yeah, I, I'm not discounting the Raptors. In fact, I think they should bring him back. Well, um, with Boston aside, because we really don't know what their thoughts are, the the one team that is out there that is allegedly interested in Lowry is New Orleans. And that, of course, makes sense. Uh, they can use a point guard, and they have, you know, a high-profile, very talented player who they would like to get to the playoffs with. Uh, something they haven't done with any kind of frequency in their history. Um, is New Orleans a real contender here, Mr. Ryan? To you first. Um, you would, you would probably think so. I'm, I'm going to say right up front. I'm not as on top of it on a day to day basis as Doug is uh, at all. Um, uh, you know, um, and so I, I can't speak to any specifics about the, their intentions or anything else. I do know the composition of the roster, I and mean, we know that Williamson is a is a fascinating piece. Mm. I'm still not sure how it's all going to work out, whether the body will even hold up uh, or not. That's been a question, I think, always about him. And so, but God knows he's an intriguing player and, um, and it, would, it, would, yeah, it would make sense to me, but uh, what, what their intentions are. I have. But with, with cap issues, I mean, aren't, uh, to both of you, Doug, first, uh, isn't Philly and the two California teams, the, 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 the Southern California teams, aren't they at the top of everybody's list? Well, the Lakers have no money or players. Yeah, Lakers have nothing anybody wants outside of LeBron James and 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 and, and Anthony Davis. So they're not going to get either of those guys. So, the Lakers as a as a destination for free agents, I think is a is a false narrative because they have no pieces. I don't think that that are good enough to to uh, put an assignment sign trade for a great player. Uh, the Clippers, you know, you have no idea how Steve Ballmer thinks, what he can do, and how they can what the machinations would be there money wise. Um, I think with Lowry, Philly is a an intriguing fit. I don't think they can get money alone without doing some sort of sign and trade. I think a team like Dallas is intriguing for Lowry. I think he can play with Doncic, and I think they're not that far away from being very good. Um, but to the New Orleans chatter the other day was intriguing in that New Orleans could certainly use a veteran point guard. But if you're 35 and you're Kyle Lowry and you want another shot or another ring, Boy. you're not getting it in New Orleans in two years. Yeah, And I don't think teams are giving Kyle Lowry four-year deals. I like, like that new, uh, that that Dallas uh, proposition, Doug. That's an interesting one. I like uh, that a lot. Uh, and, and thinking of Philadelphia, yeah, they, we have to talk about the, the incumbent so-called point guard, <laughs> who apparently is on the trading block. And and oh, I got to ask you, find out that would you want him? You no you, personally, would you want him? No, I would not. Thank you. I don't, I don't we have, we have a, a, a international agreement here across, <laughs> the border, across the 49th parallel agreement that I don't want him either. Nope. I've had it with him. I'm, uh, he's had enough time to to grow up, be a man, get in the gym, lock yourself in for three hours a day, and get a damn jump shot. A hundred percent. 
Well, Doc, obviously, uh, obviously Doc, Doc Rivers feels the same way, Bob. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think I think I think most basketball people do. This guy's had four years in the NBA and he's no better shooter than he was when he came in. And that's work ethic. Because you can teach shooting. And he hasn't been willing to learn how to do it. Whether it's mental that he won't take it, but I think it's physically can't take it. And I don't want him at $130 million left on, on his deal on my team because in this day and the age in the NBA, you can't play with four guys who can shoot and a guy who won't. And a guy you got to take out of the game who happens to be it's the first point guard in my memory that has to be removed from the game when the crunch time comes or, or should be in certain circumstances. Yeah. Never. That's unimaginable, really. It would have been unimaginable, but we're looking at it. <laughs> it is imaginable. <laughs> well, what occurs to me, guys, is with an absence of real quality or even depth at the free agent market. And we have already identified, oh, I don't know, five or six teams that have needs. And there are probably, well, I mean, there are 30 teams that have needs. Um, are we going to see more trades? Is that a, a greater likelihood during this off season? Oh, I think so for sure. I don't know. I think Portland has to trade something. They have to do, I don't think they have to do Lillard, but I think they have to do one of Lillard or McCollum. I think Philly has to do something, obviously. I don't know what the Knicks are going to do to, to get guys to come in there to help that growing team get a little bit better. And Miami's cap situation is I think they got to look at a trade. And we, we all, we can sit here in our, in our respective homes and say, yeah, it's going to be a crazy busy trade season. But trades are really hard, money-wise, personnel-wise, fit in roster-wise. But you would think this summer, that this two-week period after the draft and before free agency, you might see some blockbusters. You might see some big names move because a lot of big names need to be moved. Jamie Lillard and, and Ben Simmons, chief among them. Bob, you agree? Yeah, I, I would think so. I, I think it's going to be interesting. Yeah, I, the, the thing is, just a, we're at a juncture, whoever wins this championship is not going to be good out in history as a great team. There, there, there is a, there's a theoretical championship available in 2022 for, for somebody. It, it isn't that you're going to automatically pencil in either the Bucks or the Suns, I don't think, if, depending on uh, if, if people are able to make certain kind of moves. You know, for instance, for instance I love this. The more I think about Dallas, uh, I like, you know, and the idea of what they, they could be, uh, and, and if that, that's a, they're an example. And uh, so, yeah, yeah I, I think it's very possible. The, 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 there's a lot of teams that are going to say, hey, we could, yeah, if we do X, you know, we could be there next year. Hey, Dallas could be, Dallas could be next year's Phoenix. Well, wait, can can somebody can somebody tell me why Lillard has to move? Uh, I, I I think it's you know what it, it's kind of like DeRozan here, Vince here. Okay, it's just time. You know they've tried everything with him. They've tried everything around him. It hasn't worked, and he is a a send, he's, you know he's a singular talent who can get you a lot of bits that might put you over the top if you're Portland. And maybe it's just time. Well, maybe it isn't, but I think right now with a, a new coach coming in who's got no experience as a head coach, the, all, the whole issue around ownership and, and Chauncey and, and how they went about that hiring, maybe it's just time for a new start for them and for Damian Lillard. Well, we talk, you know, we see a lot of, of great players who can't win championships, don't win championships, and so many suggest it's the players around them. But maybe the true greatness in a player is his ability to make those around him better. And is Lillard, is there something in Lillard's game that suggests he might not be that kind of guy, incapable of elevating the four teammates on the court with him? Pause well, for effect. I'm always Come hesitant on. to go down that route myself in terms of, of uh, this phrase that has gained greater and greater currency as time goes on, making other players better, I, I think is a somewhat a misleading concept. It's, it's complimenting people. It's, it's enabling other people to do what they do best kind of thing. I, I guess if that's the same thing, but, you know, and I just think uh, it's just like with this whole thing, if Chris Paul goes down, if they don't, if they go down, uh, uh, are people really going to dwell on this thing that Chris Paul uh, is the, is a some kind of a failure and 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 when when he was a six foot guard never forget that I and the other thing is I think people in these narratives guards are compliments as a rule the people who can influence out of proportion are mid sized players who have full complete games they can affect the game in in 
many different ways, you know, whether it's scoring, rebounding, defense, and, and leadership. And, and ordinarily, a guard can't do that. I'm sorry. There's only so much a guard can do. So I, I just, I'm, I'm, I'm rambling a bit here. But so I want to absolve uh, Paul in, in advance of a defeat. And I want to absolve <laughs> Lillard uh, in advance. Uh, they're not, no, it's, it, there aren't that many kind of guys that, that deserve to be put in that category. And I don't think any guards, frankly, are, 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 as a rule are, are, are in that category. Your sense on it, Smitty? I, I think that's a really, I think it's a really interesting and a really valid point. You look at the guys who have, who have affected the greatness of the players around them and made their teams, you know, championship caliber are in the recent era, Kawhi Leonard, who's six foot one. seven wing, um, Kobe Bryant, who was a six foot six wing for, for, for all intents and purposes. He wasn't a guard for per se that, you know, that kind of level of player isn't Chris Paul and isn't Damian Lillard and it's not Kyle Lowry. Oh, Kyle Lowry was a great player and he won a championship because he had Kawhi Leonard next to him. Mm-hmm. And I think, those all around players are, you know, you look at Giannis, you know, he's a, he's a, he's a six foot 11 guy, but he's also, he's basically a wing player. And, and, you know, those are the guys who, for want of a better phrase, elevate those around them. We'll go back to, you know, the, you know, the, the two that always get compared that we're always comparing, you know, Michael and LeBron. I mean, you know, yeah. they, they fit that. And, and then Larry Rosen, you throw Larry into that. And sure. this is where Doncic comes in because he is reminiscent of, Larry, I will say that very distinctly. I have to admit that. And, you know, and um, I've been waiting for that to happen. It's happened. We have one. We have a guy that reminds me of Larry Bird. And, and that's, I was, wasn't sure I'd live to see that. So anyway, but it, to me, I, this is a theory I've developed. And I remember go back with Isaiah Thomas, and, and I, who was a tremendously singular talent. But, but he had to adjust. To, he had to come to a realization he, he, he can't dominate. That he has to complement as well and know when to pick his spots you know he, and you know when he was he didn't win when, when he had that 24 point five point quarter third quarter in in, in uh, la uh it was remarkable but they didn't win you know he won yeah. he won when they finally got enough total pieces in the puzzle and they played and, and, and they won twice and he was a very important part of it but it, you know, i'm not gonna i don't think it was necessarily built around him it's hard to build around a six foot guy you gotta understand that yeah, and I think that's what I, I, I with Doncic, for instance, right now, I think he needs that other guy. He needs that guard with him. I think because I think he's a wing player who's disguised as a point as a point guard. <clears throat> he is the closest thing. Larry is a very good, very apt description, but he's also got a lot of Kobe in him where he doesn't need the ball and he can just do stuff because someone else is dribbling the ball to court and throwing it to him instead of him bringing it up and either throwing it to somebody or doing his own stuff. But you guys had one of the most really Kawhi is an interesting. It's going to be interesting to see how history treats him and how yeah. when they look at the fact that he was a part of these separate championship teams and 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 um, and the way his understated game, you know, seemed to just work so damn well. It, it was um, it was unbelievable to watch him for a full year because you could see layers of his game that you certainly never saw on television. You certainly didn't see him when you're watching the Spurs twice a year in person. Layers of the way he impacted games at the at the exact moment he needed to. Mm-hmm. was stunning at both Defensively, ends. offensively both ends right just just something he could do and you talk about the greats being elevate being able to elevate you ask whether guys guys can elevate their games in the playoffs Kawhi Leonard was exponentially better in the postseason than he was in a regular season because it mattered more and he had that extra gear and man that gear was unbelievable to watch uh, let's take the break, and when we come back, we'll uh, take a look at the uh, NBA final, where we're at, uh, how we got here, and uh, what to look for in uh, Game 6, and who knows, maybe Game 7. We'll come back after these messages. It's McCowan and Shannon with Doug Smith and Bob Ryan as we uh, take a look at basketball. Uh, the, the final is ongoing. I, before we get into the specifics of this, the NBA has had... I guess a fairly long-standing history of dragging the final out. And I know that television plays a role in this, maybe the most definitive role in it. But I must say, um, as a fan, there's a tendency to lose interest in a big hurry when you get these, any break of more than one night. And I, I frankly, other than television and revenue, which I guess is a big thing, I don't get it. Mr. Ryan, does it drive you crazy? You are preaching not just to the choir, but to the <laughs> Tabernacle Choir. Uh, there is no logical 
earthly reason why you go Saturday, Tuesday at this point, especially when you're where we are. And in July, you know, some kind of accommodation to common sense, the abrogation of common sense in this uh, for whatever television purpose uh, that they would, didn't want to play Monday is, and they're playing Tuesday. Uh, I, 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 Wednesday, I mean, I'm talking, what, what, what day is this? On Tuesday, yeah. I mean, anyway, you know what I'm saying? The, oh, the dragon, this has been going on for years. We commented about this, Bob, for years. The, the, the absurdity of two weeks, it is a two week stretch to get a seven game series in, in the NBA as a rule. Preposterous. Uh, and and uh, except we know why television wants it so what, for whatever reason that, that they have determined and there's, there's no other reason for it. the only other conceivable reason over the years has been a re- arena availability if that were an issue you know uh and that has i'm saying that uh, historically mm-hmm. you know i remember when and that used to be a big one by the way back in the 50s and 60s oh sure big yeah. one and i understand that but that's no longer the, the issue and travel isn't an issue either. I mean, let's no. face it. It used to, you know, the, the days of flying commercial don't exist anymore either. I mean, so, right. so everybody could be there. I Last week when they went one game in five days, <sighs> that to me was as, and I love the NBA. I love basketball. And for, for, for that to occur no. just drove me yeah. nuts. Well, you lose interest, you lose touch. You, you know, you have to refresh your memory with, what what has happened who's, who's in the series <laughs> well almost you know smitty does it drive yeah. you nuts too oh it drives it drives me absolutely bonkers it drove me bonkers covering it and that was back when there was only two days off on the travel days so there you played every other day in the cities but s- since they've gone to two two one 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 now you have those extra travel days built in that extend it by four days mm-hmm. this year they did it they had to move up game one because of both the finals conference finals ended quickly. So you had an extra day off in Phoenix between games one and in, in, in Milwaukee between games one and two. Right. But that's ridiculous to me. And you're right. It, I hope it's an aberration because it's the first July finals ever. And probably hopefully the last, yeah. because this is, I'm basically in the series and I got, I'm losing interest in those, the number of off days. Well, um the nba is a very they're a smart group of people so far be it from us to critique their decisions but the only thing we can come up with that makes any sense is that it's an economic thing and when you got billions of dollars on the line from that national television yeah i guess you do what they tell you to do huh yeah you know in this case now did 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 anybody expect this series to be this way after uh, five games, Milwaukee have three, two after Phoenix won the first two games, Bob, did you, I would have thought that after the, the Phoenix won the first two games that it would, they'd be up three, two. Uh, I, 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 and I have proof. I can prove that by virtue of audio evidence that when it was two, Oh, I said, okay, I've been here t- many times and don't be shocked if they win if, if we're two, two going back home and exactly that's what happened. And then, then the fun starts, I thought in game five, um, no, so, you know, I, I, I've seen them all. I mean, really, Doug, has we've seen everything happen. And, you know, uh, we've seen 2-0 turn into 0-4 back in 77 with Philadelphia and, and, and Portland. There probably have been others that I have forgotten, but there was a finals that went that way. I mean, I've seen them all. No, um, I, we're seeing certain things unfold as time goes on. And one of the things, right, I don't want to jump the gun here. So the answer is, um, I would have thought it would be 3-2 Phoenix at the, uh, if you, when it was uh, uh, 2-2, 2-0, but uh, not 3-2 Milwaukee. That's the truth. We have, we generically have uh, spent a lot of time praising Antetokounmpo and his play and with merit. He has been terrific. Uh, the singular star of this series, I suppose. And yet, really, from my perspective, as best I can recall the early games through the last few, really this series is being won by Milwaukee on the backboards, isn't it? This is well, being that- won by rebounding as much mm-hmm. as anything. They're just stronger. They're stronger and tougher. And then they're, they're sort of beating up the Suns. And yeah, it absolutely is a factor. Their physical, their physical play is something that Phoenix can't match. I would have thought Phoenix would have had a, a big advantage in a backcourt with Paul Booker against uh, 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 Holiday and whoever, Middleton, I guess, mm-hmm. if, if, if he's the, the two guard. Mm-hmm. And that hasn't, that hasn't played out. But I'm a little bit disappointed in the way that uh, uh, DeAndre Ayton has, has held himself physically and Crowder as well, who's a tough guy. But I think that the, 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 the Bucks are just sort of beating them up. And this, I don't know what the second chance points are in the five games they've played. 
but I would say it's an overwhelming advantage to Milwaukee. And there, there I think is the difference in, in why we're three, two bucks instead of three, two sons. I think Ryan, when, you concur. Um, yeah, I think that's a factor. I definitely, I don't think it's the determining factor necessarily. Uh, I think that a couple of things come to mind. One is that, uh, well, when it's all said and done, we've had the last two games come down to the last minute and the, um, uh, the old adage that Magic Johnson gave us 35 plus years ago about winning time. And we got the winning time. The fact is that the last two winning times have been won by Milwaukee. They made the big plays. Uh, they made the big plays in, 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 in both these last two games and, and, and that won the game at the end. And when it was all said and done, it was, it was available to Phoenix twice. They couldn't get it done. Milwaukee did, period, to me. That's number one. Number two, I think Milwaukee's had more weapons. And, and in addition to the big three who all played tremendously, their you know, so-called big three, their three stars came up big simultaneously, but they've had a guy that has been a really quiet killer uh, and, and, and a component, and that's Pat Connaughton. Pat Connaughton gets yeah. the best supporting mm-hmm. actor in this series right now for me. Whoever gets the, uh, the, the, the best role, the lead, best role in a, uh, actor, it's going to be Pat Connaughton. And not just the three-point shots. He guards, and, and he's, he's intelligent. He makes... He's not creative, but he makes the right pass. He understands the game very well, and he's been a consistent, useful asset off the bench, and Phoenix has had nobody like that at all. Yeah, Connaughton's – I'm amazed at how tough he is. I didn't think he was that tough. You, you know he could shoot because that's what he does, but yeah. like Bob said, the way he guards, the way he guards multiple positions, and just his feistiness. I, I, I'm really impressed with him. I think – He's made himself a lot of money and a lot of fame in his, these five games. Now, you know, as long as people understand, you know, what the limit is here. He's not a star. No, you no. Know, but but boy, he's found a role here. And if you understand and treat him, you know, and you know, somebody, you know, oh, we all don't we all know somebody will probably come in and overpay him someday. You know, <laughs> yeah. You know, because ask him, ask him to do stuff he can't do. Right, right. So but, he's going to take the money. Boy, is he is he making a case for? That kind of guy uh, on a team to find a guy that can give you that kind of diverse auxiliary help you know and he has a great specialty of course you know he's one of the best three-point shooters but it's he's so much more than that now i have to give you there's a there's a a a, a preface here a preamble he's local i'm very (laughs) i'm very very provincially and protective of him he is really local local high school uh you know and that and second thing is you know as you know guys know he's a multi-sport guy right he said he has pitched minor league baseball. He throws 95. Uh, yeah. So there's a lot to like about this kid. And I got one more. I had him as a podcast guest on another po- on a podcast. So <laughs> I'm all, I am completely hopelessly biased in favor of Pat Connaughton. The, the amazing thing for me is, is that uh, prior to this series, look how close Milwaukee was to not being in this position. And without Giannis oh. playing. Oh, a toenail of of uh, you know who Durant. Yeah, if, 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 yeah, right. if, if he's eight, eight feet. inches back, the Bucks are dead. The series is over. They I mean, lose. They're that, done. And, and that's not hyperbole. That is the gospel truth. Yeah. And <laughs> and Budenholzer gets fired, and who knows who they trade, and you know, all kinds <laughs> of different things. And now it's not going to happen. But again, they, they you know they won the last two games against the Nets. However, they did it. They still did it. They beat Milwaukee or beat Atlanta without Antetokounmpo. Right. Like Bob says, winning time, this is a veteran team that wins in winning time. And the, the Suns, as we've seen in the last two games, are not a veteran team that doesn't win at winning time. And I think that's a there's a lot to be said for having been through the wars like the Bucks have. And well, that's the them, point. Yeah, I think that's them, the and point. And the Suns haven't. Yeah, you, I mean, you, you know, the, the, the Bucks have learned how to lose yeah. and now have learned how to win in the postseason. And the Suns haven't been in that position. Is Drew this Holiday getting enough sons, attention? First time. Sorry, John. I was just saying, is Drew Holiday getting enough attention through this whole thing? Oh, he's off game, off game five, he sure did. Well, he did in he was, game five, yeah. But he was pretty average in a couple of these games. Okay. But Four when it counted, when, when the, the, the basically the season was on the line, he made the plays and had the game. So, yeah, I'll props to him because they got him for that kind of moment and he, he rose to the occasion in it. As a professional athlete, every night is a separate night. You're not supposed to look back. You're not supposed to have any memory of what happened before. Um, but I, one of the things that if I'm, the, I'm, if I'm a Suns fan really concerns me is they jump out to a big lead in game five and wind up losing. 
And um, I think probably as much as anything, that creates doubt that is difficult to get rid of and could come back and bite them in the keister um, in game six or even in game seven. I, I don't know how you... I, I know this happens regularly in the NBA, but I think it's impactful to the psyche of the athlete. Mr. Ryan? Well, I'm not prepared to go all the way to go. No? Given how common juxt big swings in the NBA are, mm -hmm. uh, regular season, post time, you know, because the, the nature of the game, and now, of course, with the three-point shot, it, it, it's even more pronounced. But when, And the nature of how they did it, Bob, in this particular occasion, it was, they made 10 straight shots in the first quarter. And they actually made an 11th that was negated by a referee's whistle. That's so abnormal. That's, that's just sick craziness. Uh, you know, that was, so uh, it was fool's gold to a degree. You know, uh, I, I think, I, I don't know. I mean, you, you make a good, an, an interesting point, but I, I'm going to flip it and just say, I think you just rationalize what I just said. <laughs> so I don't know. <laughs> Home well, court mean anything, Bob? I think it, it certainly does in a, in a, uh, more often than not in a seventh game, particularly. Uh, yeah. But I also, it's dependent on, are either of these teams, look, neither of these teams are going to get out of history as a great team. This is going to be a, an almost accidental history, both of them, this year, particularly given the, what happened to the Nets, who never got themselves together. But, you know, I think there's no question in my mind that had they been together, you know, long enough to do it, they would have won. But um, anyway, um, what I'm getting is, they're either, neither one's that great that, that they have to hold court or that they are going to overcome the home court or I just don't think either of them that great. So, and it doesn't surprise me, uh, whatever happens. I, I, although at this point I must say, um, because of this preponderance of, of uh, help that they have from auxiliary forces, I, I like Milwaukee to, to do it one way, you know, one game or the other. It's almost too good. It's almost, it's almost like game five with the Raptors and Warriors. It's all set up for the Bucks to win. Playing at home, up the series, 65 mm -hmm. people, thousand people in the streets, fans crazy, city ready to erupt. Well, they gotta lose. <laughs> well, let's before we wrap it up, let's get to the point then. I mean, who wins who wins game six? Who well, if it's Milwaukee, the series is over. I don't have to ask the second question. Who wins game six? Before well, I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go right against what I just said and, and say that the Bucks are gonna win. I think they're better. I think they're a better team. They played better in the series, and I don't think I think they have too many weapons to lose uh, tonight. I, I think I think it's over. And I picked the Suns in six when it started, but the Connaughton factor and Lopez and the the skittishness of the Suns is going to cost them. Bob, you agree? Well, I, I I'm almost I'm almost Mr. Echo here because I too thought the Suns would win in six when it was two zero. Uh, I thought that's where it would wind up. Being that they would win in six, but what I'm watching and seeing is it's hard for me to go against the Bucks, and and they just are they do have more things going for them uh, at all, and, and in, in general, and and um, uh, it seems like mm. that that Instacrombo has figured out, and they have figured out how best to utilize him uh, to uh, in, in a way that wasn't the last two years, and uh, I, I think they're going to win in six. Yeah. You want to throw your two cents in, Shannon? No, these two guys are experts. But I want to—I want to hijack the the conversation for one minute, as I okay. normally do at this point. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> we well. have one of the great basketball historians with us, uh, in Bob Ryan. Um, Dennis Murphy passed away this week. Uh, did you have any meetings with Dennis Murphy? Did you know Dennis Murphy? No, only of Dennis Murphy. What a fascinating mindset the mind that man had the the the, the stuff that he did the, the way he thought including telling us that roller roller hockey was maybe going to be the sport of the future but you know i didn't uh, but i'm i was i, I knew we certainly knew well i knew of him yeah the only reason i ask is because you know the league that he was part of in this sport in the aba oh, yeah. probably had more influence in changing rules than the other sports he was part of like the WHA just played hockey, roller hockey, international, whatever it was, you know, but the ABA changed the way the game was played with the three point line. Yep. They adopted a line that had been, you know, the ABA, the three point was the invention of a promoter. It was a gimmick of yeah. Abe Saperstein in the American basketball league picked up by the Eastern league when the ABL folded after a year and a half and then adopted by the ABA in, 15, in 1966. And absolutely. Uh, 
uh, it, it's had a profound influence. It's the most single, most important, the uh, two most important things in the history of development of the game, of course, 24 second clock mm -hmm. and a three point shot. There's no I doubt. Guess, I, want, I want to hijack this one time too, because we do have one of basketball's great historians. And you may not know this, but Mr. Ryan and I have watched a lot of last place games in Olympic basketball <laughs> over the course of the years. And I'm just wondering <laughs> how you see these aberrational Tokyo games playing out with, we saw the dream team, the only dream team in 92. Right. What, what do you think, what do you think goes on this year? I think that the, what we've seen with these exhibitions, losing to Australia was one thing, losing to Nigeria was sobering. I know they said Nigeria had seven NBA players, name one, you know, <laughs> but um, they're vulnerable. They're highly vulnerable. But the question is, does anybody have enough wherewithal? What, who is it? Uh, we might get an equity. We might get a little clue, uh, Doug, in the first game. They play France. France, yeah. France has got some NBA players. They got Rudy Gobert. You know, they, they got Batum. They got they got some players, uh, and four or five NBA players. Uh, if only they had Tony Parker back in his prime, then yeah. it would be really interesting, right? But anyway, um, they're vulnerable. I do expect them. I still believe they're going to win, but uh, it's going to be a struggle. And uh, I, I think in. Uh, but I don't know who that team is the way Spain was the last two times out that right. took them down to the wire in the last three minutes of both those games in, in, in uh, London and Beijing. But um, uh, you know what? This has heightened my interest. This is definitely <laughs> it has, all, absolutely. only heightened my interest. I have much more interest in these and in, in seeing how this the Olympic basketball is going to be played out than I did prior to that Nigerian game. Mm -hmm. Believe me. Yeah. I said, wow, whoa, uh, I'm, I'm going to have to see what's going on here. <laughs> well, the outcome is not given. I think that's what we uh, can concede. Yeah, great. Um, guys, we'll let you go. We thank you, as always, for your time. If we don't chat again, uh, hopefully we do uh, before the summer's out. But if we don't, uh, have a great rest of the summer, and uh, we'll uh, catch up with you in the fall. Thank you, boys. All right, Let's you got it. Thanks. Talk, talk soon. Doug Smith, Bob Ryan. John and I will be back after this. And we are back. It's uh, McCowan and Shannon again. Our thanks to uh, Dave to Dave, to Doug Smith, and to uh, Bob Ryan. What? There's no Dave. What? No, there's no Dave. Dave did not appear today. Dave no, was scheduled but I'll tell you what, it, I'll talk to the producer. We'll try to book somebody named Dave. Somebody named, anybody named Dave. I don't know where the <laughs> hell that came from. Um, we move on uh, tomorrow. Uh, we, I think, alluded to this during our conversation. I don't know whether it was before we uh, started recording or not, but um, big week for hockey, and yep. it commences tomorrow with the Kraken selecting their players. Mm -hmm. And what is intriguing about this, without getting into specifics, is that there are a significant number of high-profile, highly paid players available in this draft. And in my mind, I'll be intrigued to see whether the Kraken decide to take all of the big names or one or two of the big names, or none of the big names. And I think any one of those things is arguably viable. What do you think? Well, they they, they have, to, first of all, they can't go over 81.5 well, million. That. They can't go over the cap, they, but they have to get to 60% of that cap, which is around $49 million. Oh, is it? Uh, yeah. In 49 million, they have oh, to go okay. to 60% 60, 60 of, the, the lowest they can be is at 60%. Oh, okay. So they, they can't go and take the cheapest player at every position from every team. And no, but they are, and, and they are prepared to, to, to pay to the max they say. Oh yeah. But you also have to, you also have to put in place that uh, you, you, you have to have some cap space during the season yeah, uh, and next season to adjust things. So, sure. I mean, that, that the interesting question will be what was Ron Francis's, magic number is it 65 million is it 70 million and gives him a little bit of flexibility uh the other thing is is that uh you know how how much interest and in, how much bartering has there been between francis and the other um 30 teams because vegas is not involved the other 30 teams to say hey take this guy don't take this guy we'll give you something that george mcphee did such a great job with uh when vegas came in a few years back. So that to me is going to be over the next few days, uh, stories that we're going to start hearing. Uh, and then if a player, one of those big name players, Bob, as you talked about, uh, isn't taken is how quickly will teams try, uh, to get rid of them via trade. Uh, and because the draft is on Friday, 
Uh, and there's usually a lot of trades on the draft floor in order to try to get prospects for, you know, veteran players. Um, I know you've had a couple of days to think about this and I'm not sure you've, uh, come up with a definitive answer or not, but, um, Kerry Price, would you, or wouldn't you do they, don't they? Uh, when I saw, when I saw the lists, I was, uh, I was bullish on taking Kerry Price bullish. I would have taken him that second. Uh, the more I think about it, the more I think about it. Um, I think it's a bit of a liability for them. I, uh, you, you know, first of all, his, his, they'll have a better idea of what his health is and whether it's short term or long term. Um, you know, the, the circumstantial evidence of him being from the Pacific Northwest, his wife being from there, they live there in the off season is part of it. But uh, the, his contract, a ten and a half million dollars for five more years is just it just handcuffs you so many ways. I think that Ron's Ron came from a frugal organization in Carolina. I think he knows how to use that cap money really well, and I think he'll stay away from it. Well, if they take if they take a ten and a half million dollar goaltender, they're probably not going to take anybody else who's in the seven eight million dollar range. Oh, well, um, yeah, yeah, that's right. But it, um, even those guys. Even like Vladimir Tarasenko, who's in that range and from St. Louis, who's, who's used to be a great sniper, uh, he's a bit of damaged goods too. I mean, how oh, is yeah. his shoulder? Uh, I mean, what's his injury situation? So there's, I think there's a ton of questions when it comes to the big money guys that have been um, made available for the draft. I think Tarasenko is about seven and a half. Yeah, yeah. Something like that. Yep. Uh, George McPhee. Uh, went through this process uh, four years ago with uh, Las Vegas. He will join us today to tell us how tomorrow. he did it. Tomorrow. I'm uh, sorry, tomorrow. Um, He's going to be with Dave. Yeah. Yeah, he'll be, <laughs> thank you. Uh, he'll take us through what he thought of, what, the, what, what situations he encountered. He really reinvented the way you can do this stuff. And now the question is, can Seattle duplicate what Vegas has done now that the other 31 teams or 30 teams more accurately realize what might be going on. And here, here's the one thing, any, any fan of any team laments losing a player laments saying, Oh, we, we, sh we should never have lost that guy. Just remember your owner of your team just put more than $20 million in his pocket for that player. Cause that's the price that he will get out of the expansion fees. George McPhee, uh, tomorrow on the program. Hope you'll join us. For John Shannon, Bob McCowan, see ya.